it's an elementary responsibility of government to protect and safeguard the life of its citizens. Uh, and that responsibility requires contingency planning uh, for emergencies. And one of the vital forms of contingency planning is pandemic planning. Uh, now, there certainly were pandemic pl planning exercises within Whitehall, um, but it would seem as though uh, not all of the recommendations were fully implemented. And there was a flawed assumption underpinning these uh, uh, exercises that any pandemic would be a flu pandemic, um, as with the Spanish flu after the First World War. But as we now know, the threat was to come from a novel coronavirus. Now, when dealing with an uncertain threat, it makes sense to apply what I would call the precautionary principle. That is, you try to minimize um, any risks involved in dealing with the problem. Yet what we saw from Boris Johnson as prime minister and from Matt Hancock as health secretary um, was a catalog of mistakes and miscalculations. Of course, they both have other preoccupations now. Um, but I thought what I would do, although much of this may well be familiar, is to provide a quick reprise of the most egregious examples of these mistakes and miscalculations, which meant that instead of minimizing risk, they were probably maximizing risk. There was the delayed lockdown in March 220. Uh, people were screaming at Boris Johnson to take steps earlier, having seen uh, what happened in Italy in particular close by and how devastating this novel virus could be. Not learning from that mistake, the same mistake was repeated in autumn 2020. Delay in a second lockdown. And this was the period when Boris Johnson, according to Dominic Cummings, was going through his let the bodies pile high phase. There was the decanting of the elderly from hospitals into care homes uh, without uh, testing. And the rhetoric at the time was talking about putting a protective arm around care homes, whereas in fact, the very opposite was happening, that this uh, negligence fueled the spread of the virus within the care homes. There were the personal protective equipment contracts, many of which went through a priority lane. And the main consideration in that priority lane uh, appeared to be having a connection with the Conservative Party. So many of the contracts were overpriced and much of the PPE turned out to be not fit for purpose. In addition to those mistakes and miscalculations, um, we had an ineffective track and trace system. It seemed to have very little impact on the spread and dissemination of the virus even though it cost taxpayers a small fortune. And that test and track system was headed up by Dido Hardy, who seemed to have little or no public health expertise. In fact, once again, her main credential seems to have been her connections with networks within the Conservative Party. And then, all restrictions eventually and all safeguards were lifted and lifted prematurely so that we finished up with an almost exclusive dependence on vaccinations and that remains the position as of now as we move into the next uh, vulnerable uh, winter period. 
So as I've said, a catalog of mistakes and miscalculations that maximize the risks in dealing with this novel threat rather than minimizing uh, the risks. The science therefore, despite repeated claims to the contrary, was simply not followed. And as a consequence, to date, over 200,000 people have lost their lives from COVID, and tens of thousands of those losses were certainly avoidable. If uh, the mistakes that I've uh, just summarized um, hadn't occurred. Now, how does this relate to the condition of the National Health Service? Because Mary, uh, as I said, wanted me to throw this into the mix. Again, I'll have to be brief. Um, the, the austerity in the 2010s. Ostensibly, the National Health Service budget was ring-fenced and protected. But again, the reality uh, was very different. Um, if you look at the trends after 2010, the increase in the largesse available to the NHS was um, very small compared with historical trends. That meant that hospital bed availability relative to the population size was lower than in many other comparable countries. Then that was further compounded by hospital bed blocking. Uh, because of the poor state of social care provision. So many elderly people were unable to be released from hospital when there was no longer a compelling case for them to stay there uh, because of the lack of social care in the community or in care homes. Then on top of that, we had a growing staffing crisis. And that staffing crisis in the NHS was made worse by the impact of Brexit and the end of um, freedom of movement. So it meant that by the time um, COVID came along, the NHS was in a very exposed position in terms of its capacity and its ability to respond to this kind of health emergency on top of all the other pressures that it was facing. And uh, to this day, the volume of COVID patients um, going into hospitals, uh, being admitted to them is um, in, the, in the thousands. And that of course, apart from anything else, has implications for infection control measures. So I say that in addition to everything else has meant that the performance standards of the NHS have continued to deteriorate. And we all know about the backlog and the frustrations with long waiting times uh, and all the rest of it. Now from that, I draw two main conclusions. First of all, uh, the political management of the pandemic was misgovernance on a grand scale. And on my desk here, I've got um, a book, I don't know if you can see it, um, and written by two leading political scientists, uh, the late Anthony King and Ivo Crew. Colin will be familiar with this book called The Blunders of Our Governments, and this was published in 2013, nearly 10 years ago. Um, if they were writing this book today, there would be a very long and a very prominent chapter on the mistakes and miscalculations that I've been talking about. So there is the link with uh, one of the key themes of these sessions, uh, the theme of governance. But in this case, we are certainly talking about misgovernance. Second conclusion is that any effective accountability will now have to come through the public inquiry, which is only just 
getting into its stride. And there's no knowing at the moment um, how long it will take for it to reach any uh, definitive conclusions. And we have to hope that um, by the time it reports that the memories of the events I've been describing are not by then uh, too hazy. Because one of the other characteristics of the management of the pandemic has been the shabby treatment of bereaved families by Boris Johnson in particular, who uh, repeatedly refused to meet their representatives. So all of this leads to the theme of misgovernance on a grand scale, and it links up with the theme of accountability, but we've yet to see that genuine accountability, and it may take some years before it feeds through um, in the form of this public inquiry. So I think those are the initial observations that I want to make. 